to that music. It's still going in the background over here. How are you, everybody? My name is Danielle Padula, Executive Director here at the Broadway Theater League of Utica. I am so excited to welcome a great friend of mine, a mentor, an entrepreneur herself, a, a go-getter, a bad kicking butt mom, um, and Miss Molly Mann is here with us today. So, Molly, thank you so much for joining us. It is my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And we'll get into, you know, meeting more about Molly and some questions, but really quick, uh, thank you once again for joining us on this beautiful Thursday afternoon. Quick subscriber update. Your invoices are on their way. You should have received them electronically already, and you can start paying on your subscription. You will still be getting something in the mail shortly, uh, so be on the lookout for that. And new subscribers, you could start saving your seating section with a deposit on your account. Just give us a call at 315-624-9444 and we'll save your seat and your spot in line. So let's get right to it. Molly, uh, we are so thankful to have you with us today. I know I've already said that before. Molly is with Bond Theatrical Group. And Molly, why don't you give us a quick background about yourself? First of all, I'm loving being here. I feel like for all of us, having been sitting in our house, uh, you know, it's so nice to connect this way and to see your face, but also to know that, you know, we're reaching your audience and your patrons, so that's great. Um, a little bit about myself, I lived in, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, and actually am, is where we're broadcasting today, um, but I am a partner at Bond Theatrical. I've been in the industry for about 20 years now, um, primarily as a booking agent. So have sort of seen it all over these last 20 years. And, um, you know, really, I, I got my start at the Orpheum Theater in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, originally, I thought that I was going to be interested in the live music space. So sort of started to go down that that road and um, ended up on the Broadway side. And it's really been everything and more I could have hoped it would be. Well, we're thankful that you landed on that side because you have been a pleasure to work with and uh, you have really helped me in the last year of my career. So I just want to thank you personally and both professionally for just always being there for the Broadway Theater League of Utica, for our community, our patrons, um, and our team here. So we're thankful you took the road of Broadway, uh, and we wish you were closer to us, but um, Tennessee's great, so we understand. Yeah, it is it's funny because, you know, we we talk to each other so much, but we don't get to see each other that much. So it's funny how I much we, in, our, in our business, so much of about it is relationship and being able to call someone and get advice. And, you know, what we're finding, especially the seat that I sit in, is that, you know, we deal with 350 markets all over the U.S. We deal with really small markets that might be in rural communities that are lucky enough to have a theater and a, and a series and a Broadway series to major markets, to San Francisco, to Chicago and Boston. And oftentimes you'll see that while the market's different and every building and every market is very specific, there's so many times that you can learn you know, one side can learn from the other. And it's an interesting perspective to have because we're able to see what some other markets may be doing and that you and I, Danielle, can then talk and say, well, what about implementing this sort of promotion or or this type of programming or this, you know, just different things that we can try. And so it's really been fun to explore that. Um, Absolutely. And and oh, go ahead. No, no, I was just, just finishing my thought. Oh, yeah, well, when we were in New York together, I know you even mentioned other theaters that were similar into our size or our population and really helped us connect um, with other markets. So that's been a great tool. And then especially in the marketing 
uh, side of it and keeping the brand the same and the show strong and, um, you know, very just comparable to other markets. So I think that's probably one of the coolest things for me in this newer role was to have other theaters that you were able to connect us with who would maybe be looking at the same subscription size or pricing and things like that, because there are so many variables that go into um, our pricing schedule, our population, our community, our uh, sponsors and supporters. So I I love the marketing piece of that and just the connection that your team is able to offer us as far as saying a city did this or a region did that and things like, um, you know, diff- different things like that. Even though everybody's so different, we share so many of the same things. So that has been a really strong, um, you know, talent that your team has able to help us with. And I think we lean on each other a lot, even from the booking side of things and the marketing side of things and, and, you know, everything in between. So I know it keeps your job interesting trying to remember all those 300 markets and who did what, but uh, we we seem to manage. It is a funny um, sort of icebreaker that I can do at cocktail parties when oftentimes I will meet somebody when they tell me they're from, oftentimes someone will say, oh, I'm from a small town in Georgia. And I say, tell me what town it is. And then they'll tell me and oftentimes I can name the theater. And they think it's really impressive that I know the theater in their town. But it's a nice, it's a nice icebreaker for people when you get to know them. But yes, it's weird the things that I now know as far as how many theater names and markets that are out there. Yeah, well, we appreciate all that. So why don't you tell our audience just a little bit about a typical day in the life of Molly? I know me and you tend to share our calls now due to COVID from home and between kids appointments and things like that. But as uh, we get into more of a routine and, and the country starts to open back up a little bit, what is a typical day like for you? And then how has COVID made um, maybe some challenges? How it's turned everything upside down. Um, well, yeah. so it's interesting that you brought up marketing and booking, and it's interesting how often those two come together. For a long time, I worked at an agency that was strictly booking, and it became very clear that marketing and booking really needed to work in tandem because so much of what we do, as far as the shows that we represent and getting the puzzle, putting the puzzle together, meaning lining up each date that each market that all root together so much of that on the sales side is really getting getting the show out there letting buyers and by that i mean presenters and and people at theaters that are going to then be booking the show how they can understand the show they can bring in their marketing their local marketing teams to understand what assets are going to be available for that show. You know, oftentimes you we hear from different theaters that while we may know the show, what tools will we have to then let our audiences know the show and and want to come and see the show and understand why that show is so special. So at Bond, we have both a booking and a marketing side, and we often work together to make sure that the shows that we'll be bringing out also have great marketing materials, meaning anything from video that people can log in to a website or see on television to see what the show looks like to print materials that you can see in a magazine or see, you know, pick up a brochure when you're in the theater to see what the show is going to be like. So we, a lot of what we do, I can sort of talk you through our process because what's funny is every day is a little different. Um, yeah. So what we do is when we have a show that we know we're going to bring out, we kind of first things first is talk internally and assess what is that show going to need specifically so that we can, uh, so that we can help put that show out there in a way that people can really want to see it and understand it. So I'll take two examples. So one of the shows that we are working on and we're so excited to debut in Utica is An Officer and a Gentleman. This is a brand new musical. It has it originated in on the West End in London and is coming over, but is completely reconceived. So it's based on obviously a movie that many people know, but nobody has seen this stage production. So we knew starting out we needed to have really strong materials. So we spoke internally. We had a whole timeline. We had our marketing side and our booking side come together to create those materials so that we could go out and let theaters know what the show is about. 
we usually start about a year and a half to two years before a show will hit a theater. Um, we'll start this process. So this is what two falls ago, 2018, we started um, talking about the officer and gentleman materials and, and the project. So once we develop those, then we, this is when I pick up the phone and I call Danielle and I tell her how great this new production is going to be and show her the materials that we've developed. And she, you know, and then, and I'm not the only one doing this. So, you know, it's funny. I think about how many shows each theater is now the challenge probably on your side in understanding the creative teams and which shows and the quality, what's going to be the quality that you want to bring to your theater. So we'll have those discussions. You ask the questions and they're often very good questions. And I usually take those questions back to our marketing team or our production team that we can really boil down to what the show is going to be. Um, and then really it's, like I said, putting the puzzle together. You, you know, we have to make sure a show. It's definitely a big puzzle. <laughs> it's a big puzzle. Can go, I mean, oftentimes these shows can play a different market every night and they have about 350 miles they can travel. So often if you're seeing a show in Utica and the show ends, the loadout will start. They will load out the entire show. They can travel up to 350 miles down the road and be there at 8 a.m. the next morning to load it in somewhere else. I don't know how these crews do this. It is miraculous, but they do. They travel in a, in a sleeper bus, so they, they load out a show, and then they sleep on the bus and wake up in another at another theater and start it again. So it is our mm -hmm. job to make that is as smooth as it can be. Um, there's a joke that every once in a while they'll claim an agent just that we just with a bl are blindfolded and are throwing darts at a map because sometimes while we would let you know, we would love to play markets that are all next to each other, a market that may make sense in that line has another has a conflict. So sometimes we'll have to circle back and come back and pick it up. So. It's our job to really make sure we understand all the markets we are going to play and then line them up the best we can. So it's a lot of staring at maps, a lot of staring at schedules. Um, that's the slightly non-glamorous side of what we do, but it's all important. And then there's them. weather. And, and then there's weather. New York. We always say the thing in booking and actually any live theater, you probably, you may feel the same. It's never the thing you think is going to go wrong. It's the thing over to the side that you weren't watching that all of a sudden comes out of nowhere because that is the nature of live theater. You never know what's going to happen. Right. And we, we, you know, had an issue. Um, and I know this is a show that we worked on together was cats was the size of the stairs. We were all ready to go and ready to run. And then, you know, we did our walkthrough and realized, you know, in the event of emergency, God forbid, we couldn't get people to, uh, get out of the theater fast enough because the pit was open and there were stairs and things like that. So that is like the quick moving things where on paper, everything looked great. And four hours before, our show we're doing our walkthrough and we're like this is not gonna fly and um you know it's the things that you hope never happen but you have to be prepared for so that's always something in the back of my mind is we're never really through a show until the last crew member leaves the theater to get on that tour bus that are parked so beautifully down genesee street that people uh can't wait to see on the show night but we are completely responsible and we feel that it's, you know, owed to the union and the stagehands and the theater and every usher and volunteers to make sure that show gets on the road safely because it could be such a ripple effect if for mm -hmm. some reason there's just one little hiccup. And I think the thing that people don't get to see that I wish more people could see is how organized loadout is as well as it comes in, it goes out just as organized, labeled, marked, crates, boxes, because that show is opening up somewhere else in the next day or two and needs to come off the truck in the same way. So it's incredible what you guys do and what your team does does not go unnoticed here in Utica. And we are you know, forever thankful that you continue to bring back such high quality shows to our beautiful community um, in such a professional way. Because I, like you said, this business is relationships. And um, when you're working with just such a strong organization and a team, it makes our job you know, a lot easier. So um, 
we know you go crazy day in and day out and you know your job probably is never done until the tour is over but right. our, the 48 hours that you're here in utica um we we like to take care of you and we appreciate everything you know that you do from a technical standpoint and and stuff like that but i wish people could experience that excitement at load in uh in the organization at loadout and just everything in between because we almost breathe when the show is on stage and I think to some people right. that is you know, the it's nerve going. Thing. It's going. Yeah. But we yeah, we often say that the the better we are at our jobs, the easier it will look. You know, it's almost like the more work that we're doing behind the scenes, if it looks seamless to everybody and it seems easy and smooth, we've done our job. It's it's yeah. and and it's not to say that when there's something that comes up, someone hasn't done their job because like I said, there's so many things out of our control. But what we do know is that with planning and proactivity and knowing all the things that could go wrong, we can almost ensure that they won't. So that's really, you know, and it is happening. And oftentimes it's not seen. I really appreciate your, your recognition of that. I mean, and again, I think some of these crews go so, um, uh, sort of unheralded for that because when they're very good, they're doing miraculous things. They can come in and oftentimes we have these production managers that walk into a theater and have to reevaluate what they're doing in two minutes because you've got 40, 50 people standing there ready to load a show in. And like you said, if there needs to be stairs need to be changed or if there's something that they weren't expecting, that's why these guys are so good because they can come in there and almost lose no time, even if they're completely changing what this huge group of people are about to do. So mm -hmm. I'm with you. I think that these guys deserve a big round of applause for what they do. Huge. Yeah. All the way yeah. from Utica, yeah. we're cheering on. Yes, it's unbelievable. And it, like I keep saying, I wish there was like a special ticket just to stay late and witness that because you get so much appreciation for live theater. I mean, you go to the show for the message and the marketing behind it and things like that. Maybe you're familiar, maybe you could tie it to a memory or something like that. But when you start to see it work from the ground up, you will go to that theater because you are committed uh, to understanding the whole process. You have witnessed it, you've seen it. And for us, we just have such an appreciation uh, for everything that everybody does, even within the theater to the cast and crew and, and the traveling side of it. But it is like down to a science. I've witnessed just due to weather, us not getting everything off the truck or thinking we're not going to and stagehands have just worked so hard with head carpenters to make sure that truck is completely loaded to give every patron the experience they deserve. So we just had this question pop up and I think it's appropriate for what we're talking about and may put you on the spot a little, but if you could think of a production that was the largest traveling cast and you know, what was that production? So can you kind of think of some of your work that was such just a, a large cast? And crew, I, think, I guess. Right. I'm trying to think of, I, I, there's some sizable ones. I mean, a lot, oftentimes, um, Les Mis and Phantom are two that come to mind because they are, I mean, it's oftentimes not just about the principles, but, you know, when you have 40 people on stage, because 20 of those people are, um, the chorus and are filling in, you know, I'm sure anybody that's seen those shows, you know, it's 42nd Street is another one that you think yeah. of. oftentimes, again, if they're doing it well, you don't necessarily realize all the people in the background doing little things. Um, you know, in some ways they can, there may be the same person as play, almost always the same person can often play two or three roles. So, you know, you may have the shopkeeper in one scene, maybe the father in another scene. Um, and they look a little different, obviously with costumes. I, I, I don't right now know exactly the, the biggest one, but, um, but yeah, I would think some of these first nationals that come out, I mean, just on a different scale, both, cast wise but you also oftentimes will see those shows <clears throat> back in the days when phantom was rolling out in 21 trucks i mean sometimes when you think about that and you know, maybe, this our, maybe this is our transition to coronavirus and how things may change trucks. but yeah i mean my heart skips a bit in the heyday you, you know to think about that it would some of these you know take three and four days to load in so what we talk about yeah. typically 
a load in may take eight hours. Um, these, these shows were taking three and four days to load in and Lion King is still, um, you know, multi-day load in and load out. So, um, you know, and it's interesting because sometimes people think bigger is better, which is we done enough shows um, that are beautiful. So, you know, each show has its own personality and brings, you know, different things to yeah. it. But it's always fun to see one of those spectacle shows that, you know, there mm -hmm. there's so much going on you can't even imagine that they're that that it's not a permanent um, production. So I, before we get into an officer and a gentleman, because you will be in Utica for an extended period of time and talk about the tech side of it, I want to touch base, like you just said, with the mega shows, the, the Disney and the Hamiltons of the world and all of that. I try to explain it to our patrons um, why maybe Utica can't always get those shows, but I think you more than anybody can explain to us what is what does a mega show mean? What goes into it? How does population and density and community and uh, theater size take into place um, when booking a mega show? Because year after year, when we ask what do people want to see, just like every other theater, I'm sure we get all the same names. And it's just sometimes we can't be in that pool to pick from. So can you give us some insight into those mega shows and really what you're looking for in a theater and in a community when booking? Sure. So first of all, let me say, I want to see those shows too. So I get that <laughs> when, you know, when you have a, when you have some of these shows that sort of transcend and become really a movement, um, I understand why that would be the show that you would want to see. Um, you know, it's interesting because most major markets that, that play full weeks. And let me just go back to say, so there's several types of touring productions out there. Um, one way to kind of break it up is actors equity and equity productions and non-equity. And I think in, in some people's minds, there is a quality difference and it's certainly not always the case. Um, sometimes it is, but I, I think, Oftentimes, one example I give is that for Rent, for example, um, when it went to Broadway, which was a huge deal, obviously it's first time on Broadway, um, and and the story with Jonathan Larson. I mean, if anyone remembers Rent, the cast was on the front of Time magazine. So just to give an, an indication of, of, of that modern day musical. All of the actors who often, her, many of them are names everyone now recognizes, Adina Menzel and Jesse Martin and Tay Diggs, were all non-equity actors. And they all got their equity cards on rent going to Broadway. So they were young, scrappy kids. And it's it made it amazing. But none of them were equity actors until they stepped foot on that stage. And I only say that. Because oftentimes, one thing that does come with union shows versus non-union is that there's just more, um, there's more rules, if you will, that they have to follow on the board. So a union show has to play an eight performance minimum. So in that way, it, they're really only able to play markets that either have an eight show subscription or just have an, a, or a sizable enough market that are going to fill, you know, if you have 2,500 seats, I'm going to do terrible at my math, but you know, somewhere around 19,000 tickets that you want to that you're going to need to sell. Um, you know, and that is, you, no one wants to play to a half empty house and most people don't want to see a show in a really, you know, with very few people there. So some of it is in, in, is about the size of the market and whether or not, you can fill all those shows, obviously, from your perspective, all those shows, each one has a cost associated with it, too. So, you know, there's also you need to be able to sell enough tickets to afford that show. Um, for the Megas, while most union shows will play one week, the Megas will play four, five, six weeks. So now not only are you talking about eight performances, you're talking about, you know, 40, 45 performances and more that you will need to be able to fill. Now, arguably, Hamilton could probably do that in any market. But when a normal tour that's playing one week on e at each market, you might be able to get 50 weeks in that, 50 markets in that one year. When you're playing, on, you know, four, five, six weeks, you're not going to be able to play very many in a year. So 
it just takes time. So in that way, even if you could do a mega and play multiple weeks, it just takes a while to get there. I'll give you an example. I mean, living in Nashville, like I said, I am, I'm a subscriber at Tennessee Performing Arts Center. So I also have a unique perspective that I am, I, I'm a subscriber to my local theater as well. And we had a passing it's been out there it played memphis before it got here it played atlanta before it got here obviously it was in chicago you know and so we patiently waited and it wasn't because i mean it obviously sold out the second it got here but the reality is that even with three tours running that's just the soonest they could come so um it, it it's not that they sit there and and say well we're not going to play utica but you know there's sort of a lot of there You'll get there. We're get there. We are fully committed to in the next couple of years. It's one of our long term goals to be, a, a, you know, a mega city, even if it means once every five years and it's the risk we take or but we and I think everybody that we work with knows that that's our ultimate end goal is to, to be a city that can play everything eventually. And, you know, yeah. And I think that that is, you know, like I said, it's sometimes it takes a little patience and you want to mm -hmm. do it so that you, you know, and I'll tell you, um, I said this to friends of mine here in Nashville because I'm a big advocate for being a subscriber. And we were, it's interesting. This is a little behind the scenes. I mean, I had to say to my friends here, you know, you want to know why Hamilton went to Memphis and why it went to Atlanta and why it went to Charlotte and Durham before it came to Nashville. Well, those markets might have 18,000, 20,000 subscribers and Nashville had something like 7,000. And this is something that producers look at to see how many subscribers does a market have that we know will be going in to play to without before they sell ad. So, you know, that was a real eye opener for people in our market just because I would say to people that I know, are you a subscriber? And oftentimes the response was, well, I've been meaning to, I just haven't gotten there. I, haven't, I want to be, I just, I need to do that. And so just so that, you know, just to know that that is something that producers look at when they, they'll, they, when they look to see what markets they're going to play in the first few years. So to everyone you so can tell, away. Your tell your friends yeah. now the time because we need bigger and shows. So yeah. So if you want happen. bigger shows, Utica, do your do your justice. Call, get on the wait list to become a subscriber. Just continue to renew your subscription. But um, yeah, definitely. I think that, that we try to advocate that, uh, you know, it's an educational piece by having you even on today. You're giving so much insight to uh, our audience and, and our patrons. So they will continue to support us and we'll get new supporters out of it. But yeah, it's an educational thing. It's a, it's a numbers thing. There's a whole lot of pieces uh, to the puzzle, but I you wanted to play everywhere. So yeah, so just know it is, but it is, you know, as you said, it's, it's, it's not for lack of you guys expressing interest or us knowing that, you know, the audience is there for it. Sometimes it's just takes a little while to get there. Absolutely. And we're going to get there and we're fully committed and uh, we, all our patrons are so wonderful. So they keep uh, helping us push the bar a little bit higher time after time. So I want to get quickly into officer and a gentleman. We have some questions around, um, you know, the tech standpoint. What does that mean? What does a tech show look like from the ground up? We have some, we had somebody ask, what does the casting process look like? Um, and then maybe what is the time frame for that When What comes first? You know, where, what, where do you start? Because with a tour, it seems to be backwards based on cities and, and longevity and how far the tour goes. But what does it look like from a show standpoint, um, I guess, would be so, the, the question. For a show like Officer, which is really starting from the ground up, um, what they'll do is first they will hold auditions to do readings. And this oftentimes will start – there's oftentimes actors that will be hired for a reading a show that will be, which is the actor you will see that eventually lands on Broadway in that same role. 
And there's other actors that will kind of feel as the show morphs and changes, they may realize they need another actor to bring something different to the role. So what they typically do is, I would say for Officer, this probably started... I, I have a hard time remembering what day it is. Okay, so it probably started this fall where they held an audition and they put it in backstage and they put it, they put it, they put it and, you know, for, for the auditions. And they'll oftentimes also, if a producer, in this case, the production company is called Workforce Production, which you know Daniel very well. Steve Gabriel is the executive producer and he's well-loved mm -hmm. and he does great work. He's wonderful. Often, an actor that he may have worked with in another show that he has, he just knows that he's got them in mind for this role. So he may call in certain specific actors to come audition, but oftentimes it's open auditions. And so what they'll do is they'll pass the reading and they'll have several readings where they're either reading the script and the script is constantly changing. But um, Dick Scanlon, who is a big Broadway name, he wrote Thoroughly Modern Millie and he's done a lot of work on a lot of shows on Broadway as far as helping with the script and directing. So he's writing and directing um, this show. So he's been consistently tweaking um, the script. And so the actors will get together and do another read through. It was great. We had a Zoom. We had our first Zoom read through that was the entire show with all the actors playing the roles. Oh. And it was fantastic. And I've never experienced something like that, that you could feel it jumping out of the screen just hearing them read it, which it got, it gave me chills because I'm, I, you could see how it was coming together and how great this was. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Really quickly, I saw you of a gentleman in New York with you back in January and Kristen in our office, and it was short and simple and sweet. It Tears, goosebumps, I mean, the whole nine. So I would have loved to have been on that Zoom call, Molly. You could have snuck us in a little pass. Um, I'll see if there's but, a video. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but keep going that yeah, it no, was just so they're continuing to do that and so what will happen is then in you know right now it's funny because you know trying to figure out when new york's going to open up to be able to have re rehearsal spaces and what's interesting is that there's a lot of shows sitting on the starting line ready for the gun to go off and once it does there's going to be this rush of shows re-auditioning and rehearsing and you know it's so it's one of those things that even Steve was saying we've got to get rehearsal space because once we can open up and do this there's going to be a lot of shows needing that exact thing so they will come in to the studio sometime this fall and really start the blocking process and the rehearsing in a in in the rehearsal space so then what they'll do is about two, two and a half weeks before the show opens in Utica, the actors will get to Utica and the crew gets there and they start loading in the show and the, and the actors will be on stage. And that's really, those two and a half weeks are so important because it truly is where the show for the first time, you know, we say it gets on its feet, it, it, is, it is up, the actors, it, it is truly where the show take the form and um it's it's an amazing experience because these people are there i mean it's eight o'clock at night to i mean 8 a.m to 11 p.m all the way through and then there's notes every day and then they come back the next day and do it all over again and it's so interesting like you said to watch all these pieces because while you've got the actors tweaking the performances and rehearsing the choreography you at the same time have the lighting director and the set designer they're on on hand also tweaking their side so it's all it just is coming together all at the same time um and it kind of seems like you do all this work you know like i said we, we do it for two years before this happens but really there's nothing you can only do so much until the lights come on and you know until all the pieces come together which is why that tech time is so important and you know finding a great partner that can Per, that we can come into a theater that feels like a very welcoming space that's that's a you know really generous with allowing our actors and our company to feel that they have a place to build this is so important that's why we love to come to Utica but we're so excited that that is what will happen in January and will December into January when we when officer and gentleman text in Utica
We cannot wait. I know the Stanley Theater is so excited to welcome you. The Broadway Theater League of Utica is so ready for you to get up here and enjoy this cold weather with us. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can't wait to meet the cast and crew and everything like that. So I know we covered quite a bit today. I'm, did we leave anything out that you could think of? Well, I feel like we could just do this for hours. I feel like I want to. We can. Come back. <laughs> Good. Yeah, no plan. Like of everything that happens. So, yeah, we can just keep going. I'm, I'm in no rush. We have no agenda. Um, I know your, your kids that I got to see previously before hopping on are probably ready for mom to get back to them. But really quick, I think the one question on everybody's mind, and we always love to ask this because right now we're working on the 2022 season, uh, you know, 21 into 22, and we've been working on some things, but I feel like you have all the information. So tell us, both from a touring standpoint and a Broadway standpoint, what are you most excited to see come out? Can you give us any hints of what you think will what will be out or maybe what Utica has a chance for, uh, just so I can stone you for the next year to get them here? <laughs> well, it's interesting because right now with Broadway being closed, there were a number of shows that were scheduled to open on Broadway that have been pushed for an entire year. So, or maybe opened and were open for a few days and then were, were forced to close. So the good news is, is that those shows are going to come back. They are scheduled to reopen as soon as, as soon as we can. Um, when I'll just kind of run through some of the highlights for me um, as far as what was on broad was scheduled to open or just opened um, girl from the North country. It's a beautiful show. It's sort of, it's one of our quiet ones that we talk about. It's the music of Bob Dylan reorchestrated set in, you know, the dust bowl mid of Midwest. Of, it's Duluth actually that it happens. Um, really thought provoking and, um, you know, especially everything that's happened in 2020. I feel like there's so many layers. It will break your heart. It will lift you up. It's a wonderful one. And then that would tour in 22, 23. So like I said, there's a, there's that uh, minute that it takes to get out. Um, another one is company. This is um, sort of Sondheim, like you've never seen it. Um, the lead character is reimagined as a woman. And so kind of think of, Carrie Bradshaw and Sex in the City, you know, as company. And I, I find it ironic that a show about people getting together in a time, following right up, following a time when we've all had to be apart. I think it's just, it's just, it's such a happy show about community and being together and who lifts you up in your life. Um, then you have your classics. I mean, we have Jesus Christ Superstar out right now um, on the Equity Tour, which, you know, Again, everything's going to get pushed, but the hope is that that will be able to go down and do splits um, in the 2022, spring of 22. So that's one that we hope can we can absolutely bring to Utica. Um, we've got Annie. I mean, the sun will come out tomorrow. Is there is there more of a time? That's your bottom to dollar. Oh, yeah, so the 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 little redhead that everyone loves will be out in twenty one twenty two. So I hope hopefully we can find a time to bring that to Utica as well. And then there's some really fun ones that are coming out. I mean, just things that I was thinking about before before we got to talk was you know there's a show called Six that is was scheduled to open on Broadway. This is it's sort of like the wives of Henry the Eighth reimagined as the Spice Girls. It is so fun and so clever. And you know one of the things that I've really enjoyed is as my children have grown up, they have started to listen to the the cast recordings and my, I have a 12 year old daughter who has had six on repeat. So if you have, it's kind of one of these, your kids will love it. You will love it. Um, and then one other show to note, a show that is actually making its North American debut in Toronto in the fall of 21, it's supposed to, and then would hopefully go into Broadway is a show called Anne Juliet, which this is another one. This imagines if, in the story of Romeo and Juliet, if Juliet hadn't killed herself or hadn't died, you know, because she couldn't be with Romeo and goes on to live her best life. And it is all the music. It's set to the music of Max Martin, who produced 
Britney Spears and Backstreet Boys and Katy Perry. And it's all the pop songs that you know. But again, it's it's empowering. It's great. So there's so many wonderful shows on the horizon, so many different types of shows, both your classics, but also brand new ones that I think even given where we are in the world, we'll just offer a whole new perspective. I mean, that's the thing that I think those of us that are in the arts are so ready to get back to Absolutely. A hundred percent. miss that. And I think it's going to be phenomenal when we get to tell these stories again, because I think we all need it very badly. Yeah. Now more than ever, we have to continue with strong, powerful messages. Uh, acceptance Broadway will and always uh, forever will be a place of acceptance where everybody's welcomed. And here at the Broadway Theater League of Utica, we can't reiterate that enough. Um, and we stand in support, obviously, uh, you know, everybody. And in a time like this, we can use it. We need these powerful messages to come back onto the stage. Um, and it is our job, you know, to educate everybody and the importance of this so molly thank you uh we will be welcoming you back soon and we will see you this winter Perfect. i know everybody enjoyed this segment thank you for you know sharing um in this and and being the educational tool that utica needed for some insight um and giving us a peek into your world that we only get to see a few times a year so we're we're forever thankful that you took this thursday afternoon with us um, and I think that, I think we covered a lot. A quick thank you again to our youth ambassadors, um, that are graduating this year. We're thinking of you all. Uh, if you want to become a youth ambassador here with Broadway Utica, just go to broadwayutica.org and fill out the application. It's for all that have a passion for the arts, the community, people, and live theater. We are here for you. Uh, you are our next generation of theater goers, and we want to welcome you with open arms into our community. Um, subscribers, be on the lookout for your invoices and your renewals. New subscribers, save your spot in line. Bank of Utica, thank you always for being a constant supporter of the arts. And once again, Miss Molly Mann, all the way from Tennessee, for sharing uh, in this Thursday with us. And I can't thank her enough. I know I probably sound like a broken record, but even 100 thank yous is never enough for all that she does for us. She is such a staple to our organization, and we are so honored to share her uh, with you all today. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you, and we will see you soon. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Uh, bye, everybody. Bye.